um, be very, very difficult to process. No, nah, it was. It was. Yeah. But, but to get back to your question, that, uh, <laughs> we were, oh, I did ask we, one of those. We were, we were <coughs> in the George Hatchaband, and, and uh, uh, our manager at the time was uh, his wife ran Swan Song Records, which was Led Zeppelin's uh, uh, recording company. And uh, they, Led Zepp had a, a big warehouse full of, of gear, uh, and they only toured a couple of times a year, so they, they'd leave it there. And we were allowed, uh, because we had the same manager as, uh, with the Swan Song Records and all that sort of stuff, we were allowed to use their gear when we played. So we played a lot more than they did. And uh, so we'd play all around England and Europe and stuff with their, with their gear. Oh, I'm sorry, I should, maybe I shouldn't have said that. No, no, but... Uh, <laughs> we'll edit that. We'll edit that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, and they had a big yellow bus, which they called the Yellow Submarine. So we were allowed to use all that gear, and it was just fantastic, you know. It was just... Uh, 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 even when you were playing, you're thinking, gee, this is Zepp's gear. Oh, I'm really pleased to hear that, because my only recollection of a, of a yellow bus being driven around by musicians was the Partridge fun. family. So, <laughs> no, you, you guys pretty much trash that legend. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> A little different in that <coughs> bus, I would say. Yeah. So, uh, so tell me a little bit about what it was like being in London during that during that crazy time. I mean, it was pretty much <coughs> agreed universally that we were going to sort of thumb our nose and thumb our nose at establishment. Yeah. Was, oh, it, was it as hedonistic as it's made uh, out, or is it is, nah. it is that myth? Well, look, look, <coughs> absolutely hedonistic because uh, the first gig that the Masters Apprentices did in, in London was was at the uh, Speakeasy, which was. You didn't start till about one or two in the morning, and all the bands would come in from uh, their gigs. And and, uh, and uh, the night, that, the first night that we went there, uh, uh, Keith Moon had, had brought along a blow dummy. up blow up dummy. <laughs> because and, he, and it was filming this, this thing at the time. I don't know what was called. What was the film? I don't, I don't know. But it, it was all dummies and things like this. You know. Yeah. So he's so brought. We got, got to know Keith really well. It, oh, at, at, at the marquee, I come in. I there's all this banging on my drums, and I thought. I'm going to kill this bro. <laughs> I'm going to kill him. And who's in there? It's Keith Moon. And he's playing on drums, and a fantastic thing. And uh, I thought, wow, Keith playing my drums out, fantastic. And um, he had this guy with him called Tiny, which was his bodyguard. And he had his, his lawyer, which had, uh, so if he said, there could be breaks in the event, the lawyer said, the <laughs> pay for it, you know. I said, sure. And so Keith goes, he does all this thing, then he gets off to the stage, a huge stage. Froze himself on the, the lights are all on the floor, and that throws himself into Max's lights, and we thought, he's killed himself. He's killed. And he says, Tiny, Tiny. So Tiny comes up, this Tiny's of nine foot two, comes and picks him up and stands him back at his feet. He says, Alright, that's it, let's go. It's a classic, was a classic, classic man, a very, very funny man. But I, I did love it at, at, at Speakeasy when, when we. Uh, and Keith had brought the dummy in, yeah. and, but he did pay for all, all, oh, the, yeah, drinks all the drinks. All so, yes. so he had all this lineup of drinks on the table that he paid for, but obviously she wasn't drinking. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously <laughs> Keith might have been. I think he might have helped himself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, and, and and that was the first gig, and, and the Who were there, and Noddy from the uh, from Slay, Slay. Uh, you know, and all these people, Ginger, Ginger Baker. Baker, yeah, and, uh, and so it was just a complete. A, a, a lot different than Australia, you know, you went over there and all of a sudden it was just this complete, uh, yeah. wonderful new world and uh, it was just hedonistic. Hedon yeah. So, yeah. so chart success, I mean, that, this is one of the, for any musician, yeah. chart success is, is, is a measure of, of indeed your success. How did it feel? How did it feel to sit there and look at that billboard or that hit parade magazine and go, damn, we're there, we're a part of this? Yeah, uh, look, for me, uh, I, I remember the throb, we were working around all little gigs in Sydney and stuff like that. Uh, we had the same manager as the Easy Beats and, and we had uh, Albert uh, uh, oh, as yeah. well. So one week we were work, working in these little places and stuff and then all of a sudden uh, a song called The Fortune Teller came out uh, and it started to go up the charts immediately. I remember we were driving down to uh, Wollongong for a gig and all of a sudden The uh, Fortune Teller came on, on the radio and we stopped the van ran around the van screaming and yelling and stuff like that and then, then went and did the gig. Within a week or two weeks we were being asked to do TV shows and, and uh, 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 Sydney Town Hall uh, uh, concerts and things like that. So it just changed everything, you know? It's, it's amazing. I remember reading <coughs> a biography um, on George Harrison and he, he said that 
it was like he and the Beatles were standing in the middle of a hurricane, whereas they, they had a complete grip on their sanity and, 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 and what they were doing. But people around them yeah. were erratic. Was it like that? Was that like sucked into that vacuum? Absolutely. Brent, look, I recorded in Abbey Road, right? And, with the, and we're in Abbey Road recording, and you'll see you there, you'll see John Lennon in a studio writing a song, you know? I mean, it was just sort of bizarre. Uh, you know, when, when you come from Australia and see the Beatles are, are there are at the same time you're there, and you've got Pink Floyd sunbaking on the roof, and it's just bizarre situations, you know? That's, that's incredible. Oh. I'm, I'm trying not to picture David Gilmore with no shirt, <laughs> but, you know, that's just me. Well, but well, if you no, get no. up when the sun comes out, no, you completely <laughs> white. Uh, yeah. Well, he's English. You know, yeah, yeah, that's is, right. They're not known for suntans. Uh -huh. um, what I what I'm sort of curious about is is England England beckons. You go to England. You great great success there, and then you come home. You come home to a country. What what was Australia like when you came back? Was it different? Had it changed? Had you changed? We changed. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we changed, we changed completely. Yeah. I mean, we went away as a. Um, a pop band, may you may as well say, and come back out there. I mean, you know, yeah, well. you know, England was one of those, you had to be good. I mean, when, when we first arrived there, um, the first band I heard on the jukebox, was Brian Peacock from the Mixtures said, listen to this, because he picked us up in the airport. Said, is that the same guy who did that push, push, that push bike song? That's it. Ah, <laughs> so, for, free, it's, you know, all right now. We went, what? We just come from Australia, and that was the thing, and, and boom. From wow. now on, it was, and go and see him free and concert, and it was just awesome stuff. Yeah, no, no. Learning, learning the trade was 